to worship and to honor God. I want to remind everybody of this. We're starting these back. We haven't had a Sunday evening potluck in about a year and 10 months, but we are going to have one tonight. If you're not sure what we do because you've forgotten or you're new here, it's really simple. Whatever your favorite food is that you like to cook and share with other people in this church, just bring that, and tonight after the evening service, which begins at 5 o'clock after that, we'll go down here to the gym, and we'll share in food together. We'll get to know each other better. Uh, my wife and I are going to bring some games, some dominoes. We might even bring a cornhole board. And so we're going to play some games together as well. This is a good way to get to know your brothers and sisters in Christ. You, you find sometimes that, you know, I wish I knew people better. This is one of the ways. You've heard me say before, our job as a church, we believe, is to create the avenues for you to walk on that will help you to be what God wants you to be. Your job is to walk on them. We can't do it for you. So I hope that everybody will come tonight. I promise you, you won't get a better meal than this. I hope everybody will be here. And then next Sunday is the fifth Sunday. There are four of these a year. One of them is next week. We do not have our regular evening service next Sunday. Instead, we are encouraging everybody to invite people to your home, or maybe you've already received an invitation to go to someone else's home. The purpose of this is, once again, so that we can build bonds with each other. When you go to somebody else's house, or you have them over to your house, and you're eating together and visiting and maybe playing some games or whatever it is you're doing, you get to know each other in a deeper way than you can in a service here. So I want to encourage everybody to do that. It's so easy for all of us to get in a rut, isn't it? And maybe you would say, you know what? The truth be known, I've kind of been in a rut. I just kind of do the same things, and I need to get out of that. We're still early in a new year, and there's time for you to change your habits, and I hope that you will do so. So what we're trying to do this year is we're trying to get all of us on board with some things that we need to be on board with. I've been talking about this the last couple of weeks. We have a good church here. But there's some things that some people aren't on board with yet. Biblical things, things that are God's will that we all need to get aboard on. And those things primarily have to do with this baseball diagram. This, of course, as you know, is the model for what we are trying to do as a church here. We're trying to see people converted to Jesus Christ but then we don't want people just to stay there. There are so many people in our country, so many people in Christianity in general, who get converted to Jesus, which is great, necessary, but they never grow, they never develop, they never mature, and they never move to second base, which is to get connected. We talked last week about get connected to other people. That's what tonight is about and next Sunday night is about. That's why we have created those kind of things so that people can get to know each other better. You won't grow spiritually without that. We need help. We need encouragement. We need support from other people in order to grow spiritually. And so you need to get connected to other people. And then also, another thing you need to get connected to is we need to get connected to a job in the church, something that you are contributing to, which I'll talk about more here in just a second. You know, when we talk about being connected to a church, when we became Christians, when we were baptized into Christ because we believed in Jesus and we wanted to entrust our life to him, that's what baptism is all about. Baptism is when you are old enough to make the decision for Jesus. You say, you know, I know Jesus is God's son, and I want to live my life for him. I want to entrust my life to him. Baptism is you pledging your allegiance to Jesus. There's actually a verse that says that. In 1 Peter 3, verse 21, you're pledging a commitment to Jesus. But when you're baptized, you're baptized into a relationship. You're baptized in a bot, into a body with other people. The church is the saved body of God's people. And there are people there. And so you're going to rub shoulders with all these people here. They become your family. Look at what this verse says. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy, they are of the same family. And so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. When you became a Christian, you were baptized into a body, into an interconnectedness, into a family of other brothers and sisters. Some of them are big, some of them are small. They come in all shapes and sizes and they come in all kinds of temperaments, right? And all kinds of likes and dislikes. But this is our family. So here's the question I want to ask you. 
when you were baptized into Christ and you were baptized in his family and now here you are, you're part of this same group of people, brothers and sisters in Christ who are your family. Once you are in here, what does God want you to do now? What do you do now? What do I do with my brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Look at this great verse in Ephesians chapter 2. It's by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, and it's not by works so that no one can boast. This is one of the foundational truths and one of the great verses of Scripture in the entire Bible. We are not saved by our works. We're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. Could I get an amen on that? I do not deserve to go to heaven, and neither do you, and it doesn't matter how hard or how long I work, that will never make me deserve to go to heaven. I'm saved by God's grace. We are not saved by our works, but listen to this. You were saved for works, to do works, as the inspired apostle Paul goes on to say. We are God's handiwork. We were created in Christ Jesus. Why? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know, a couple of these phrases and words that I underlined here, you see this word handiwork right here? Your version might say we are God's workmanship or handiwork. You know what that word is in the original language? The original language is the Greek word poema. Guess what word we get from that? Poem. You are God's poem. And what he means by this is God spent special time and special attention creating you in a very unique way. You are not the result of an assembly line. You are not an assembly line product. You are handcrafted. You are God's poem. He made you unique. There is nobody else on earth that ever has been exactly like you, and there is no one else on earth who ever will be exactly like you. Only you can play the part that God wants you to make. He says, we're created in Christ Jesus. We're his specially crafted, uh, special creation, and what does he want us to do? He wants us to do good works. God created you and he created me to serve. That is why we are here. We were created to serve God. And there's, even though I think all of us know that, let's admit it. We live in a culture that teaches us to sit back and watch everybody else serve, don't we? And some in church have picked up on that. Let me just ask you a question. Ask yourself this question. Seriously, think about it. What are you doing right now? What are you doing that contributes, that serves this local body of people? That's a good question. Now, we have some faithful, dedicated servants here who are really knocking themselves out in service, but we have others who haven't gotten that message yet. I hope that you will rethink in this new year and say, you know what, I really haven't been serving the local body of Christ as I should. And this is God's will for me, plainly, as this verse and some other verses show. Look at this verse in Ephesians chapter 4. Paul said, Christ himself gave the apostles, he gave the prophets, he gave the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Why did he give them? Here's why. To equip his people for works of service. So that the body of Christ can be built up until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. And we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now I want you to pay close attention to what Paul says. Here is the reason God put leaders in a church. He, he mentions leaders right here. He gave the apostles. He gave the prophets. He gave the evangelists. He gave the pastors and teachers. What is their job? To equip his people for works of service. So let me stop right there. I'm the preaching minister at this church. Tyler is the youth minister at this church. Ken is the worship minister at this church. And we have eight elders or pastors or shepherds. And then we have a slew of deacons, which are also special servants. According to this, and I'm assuming God's right, my job and Tyler's job, and Ken's job, and the elder's job, 
And the deacon's job is not to do all the work. Our job, as it says, is to equip his people, that's you, for works of service. My job is primarily to make sure you understand that it is your job as well. Now, I work, and so does Tyler, and so does Ken, and so do our elders and deacons. They all work. I can attest to that. And they do a lot. But our job is also to equip you for works of service so that you also will do it. And the result of that is so that we will become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We become mature. Maturity is not an end of an end of it in and of itself we become mature so that we can minister and the word minister means to serve we mature with the ultimate goal so that we are going to serve other people and then I love the way he ends this verse verse 16 from him the whole body it's joined and held together by every supporting ligament and it grows and it builds itself up but only as each part does its work What he's saying is the only way that this church or any local church is going to grow and be what it's supposed to be is as each individual part, which is handcrafted by God, God's poem, only as each and every individual cog does its work. If each and every person doesn't do the job that God created them to do, then it's not going to work. Let me think, think about this for a second. Right now there's a bunch of sickness going around. We have two of our elders who are out sick today. Joe Priest is is very sick. And then Chip Langston has a severe case of COVID. We need to be in prayer for them. What happens when you get sick? Well, or what happens when a certain part of your body quits functioning? You get sick. That's why you get sick, because a certain part of your body quits functioning. Now, let me do a kind of a crazy illustration. What do you think would happen if your liver, you know, an organ in your body, if your liver decided one day said you know what I'm tired of this I'm tired of doing all this work that I do nobody even sees what I'm doing all the time I'm hidden I don't get any glory like the eyes do or like you know the hands do or anything like that I'm doing all I'm tired of this I'm going to take some time off just for me what do you think would happen boy you'd be in trouble wouldn't you Your liver, even though you don't see what your liver's doing, your liver performs very, very vital and necessary functions in your body. And every individual part of the body is necessary. No matter how hidden, no matter how seemingly unimportant it is, every single little part of your body is important. That's the case with a physical body. That's the case in machinery. Let me give an example. One time when Tiffany was little, Laura and Tiffany and I were making our annual trek out to Laura's parents' house who live in New Mexico for our Christmas vacation. This was when Tiffany was real little. This was probably in about the year 2004 or 5, somewhere around in there. And we had a a minivan at the time, which you're supposed to have if you have a kid. And we were driving out to New Mexico. We were near Van Horn, Texas. You ever been to Van Horn, Texas? Literally out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of nowhere. And we're driving along down the interstate at, you know, 75 miles an hour or whatever the uh, fast we were going. And all of a sudden, everything's going good. All of a sudden, our our van just goes, it just stopped, quit working. Fortunately, we were right by Van Horn, and we're able to get to this, uh, you know, a big uh, truck stop kind of thing. And we had to call, we couldn't get it to work, and it was on a Sunday, and nothing was, we couldn't get anybody to come help us. We had to call Laura's dad, and he came with the trailer and picked us up and everything, got it to Las Cruces and got it fixed. You know what was wrong with our van that disabled the entire vehicle? There's a little bitty part, very inexpensive, called a speed sensor. The speed sensor, a little bitty part that nobody ever sees, went out and completely disabled our whole vehicle. And we sat there at a convenience store for six hours, and we saw all kinds of interesting stuff taking place. Because this was a place also that was the Greyhound bus stop, and we saw all kinds of transactions and other stuff going on there. Uh, If I was the policeman, I would have just parked there and paid close attention. But anyway, uh, we saw all kinds of things, and it all happened because a little bitty part, a speed sensor, went out. And the same thing happens in a church. Now, I know what happens if you're a person who's in a church like this church here, 
And let's say that you have some job that not very many people see or maybe nobody sees. And here's what you think sometimes. You think that job's not very important because I don't get to be up on the stage or I don't get to lead singing or, or whatever, whatever you think is some prominent job. Every job in the church is important. Let me give you an illustration. At the last church that we served in Alabama uh, a long time ago, this was back in about the year 2010, I was teaching a class, an adult class, in our fellowship hall, which was detached from our church building, and there was a breezeway between the fellowship hall and the church building. And it was right at 9.30, you know, we had Bible class at the scriptural time also, and it was at 9.30, and we were in the fellowship hall, and I was about to get the class started, and I, I looked through the windows, and I saw a couple that I didn't recognize. I knew everybody in that church. And there was a couple that had two or three kids, and they were coming right at 9.30 to go to Bible class. Nobody greeted them out at the door. They walked into the church building, and I found out later that they kind of had to look around. They didn't know where the class was for their little kids. And when somebody finally showed them where it was, they got there at the time that we had posted that the Bible class is supposed to start, and the teacher wasn't there. And this couple, visitors to our church, had to wait about 15 minutes before the teacher ever did show up. This was a visiting couple. Let me ask y'all a question. How many of you think that this couple was so impressed with our church that they said, this is the church we want to be a part of. We're going to be here next Sunday. How many of you think that happened? We never saw them again. They never came back. And through discussions with other people, I could tell some of those Bible class teachers in that church, they didn't think it was important at all to be on time. Yes, it is. And it's important for you to be part of that Bible class. And let's say you're a nursery worker. Some of you take turns in our nursery here. And maybe it's your month this month. You know, we go in the nursery and I don't think that's important. Oh, yes, it is. What if you have a young couple that has some, some, chill, some kids that need to be uh, attended to and you take them down to the nursery and nobody's there? It's important. It's an important job. My point is, no matter what job it is that you are doing in this church, everything is vitally important. Let me give you some statistics. Some of these I've given you before, some that I haven't. Did you know that when a guest visits a church, the vast majority of them, way over 50%, the vast majority of them, they determine whether or not they are going to come back to that church within the first 10 minutes of arrival before the service ever starts. That's a fact. What that means is, it's not only my job to make sure that people are blessed, it's also your job. Well, we have greeters out here. We have some people who have just taken upon themselves, Steve and Phil and some other, Robert and some guys like that. They greet people coming in. That's a great thing. It says something to people. You know, they have people waiting at the door. And our guys have even gone so far, they have a bag of candy. They know how to do it. And not only do the kids like it, I've discovered that adults like that as well. And they give them a lollipop or, or some piece of candy, you know, that tells them, that does communicate something to them. That communicates, you know, we care about you. We notice that you're here. We see you. You greet them with a smile and you welcome them. And then it's important also that when they come in the door, then there are other people who greet them and welcome them and notice them. These things are very important. And a lot of these guests determine whether or not they're going to come back based upon how friendly and welcoming a church is. I know I've given you this statistic before, but it's true and it's really important. 80%, 80% of all first-time guests determine whether or not they're going to come back to your church based upon how clean your bathrooms are. That's a fact. Now, I know what you're thinking. And here's what I think. You know, I work here. I never even hardly notice how clean the bathrooms are. And I'm not basing whether I'm coming back to this church or not on how clean the bathrooms are. But I'm a, you know, a bought-in member of this church. I'm going to be committed to this church no matter what. But that's how I think. That's not how a guest thinks. How clean your bathrooms are matters. That means that the janitors are very important at this church. Every little job, everything that we think is not all that important, every single thing like that really 
matters a lot. I love this great verse in 1 Corinthians 12. It says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. Why did God give you the gifts that he gave you? Everybody has one. Your gift might not be public speaking. God didn't give everybody that gift. Your gift might not be song leading like mine is not. God didn't give me that gift because he didn't want me to do that. But he gave everybody in here, he gave everybody some gift. And what he wants you to do with that gift, as he says right here, it's given to you so that we can help each other. And then I love this great verse in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. He says, as each one has received a special gift, we need to employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whatever gift you've been given, he says, and I love the way the New American Standard translates it. You've been given a special gift. What does God want you to do? He wants you to employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Here's the problem in the church. We have too many unemployed Christians. They have a gift, but they haven't employed it. If that's the case with you, why would you want to keep on doing the same thing? Now, we have a lot of great servants in this church. We have some people that are really dedicated in this church. But we have a lot who, I guess they know this truth, but it hasn't really sunk in as to how important it is. Every single person who has been created by God, a special masterpiece, a special little poem, every person is vital in this church. And I just hope everybody would understand that. So I want to... Kind of as we start bringing this to a close, I want us to think about this one little question right here. I want everybody to think about it. What is holding you back from acting on God's call to serve him? God has called you to serve him. He has equipped you to serve him. He has gifted you in a special way to serve him. And serving him primarily means you're serving other people. And so the question is, What's holding you back from doing that? What is it? God wants you to address that problem this year, and he wants you to begin to change things. You see, it's not enough just for us to have a bunch of information and to keep learning. There comes a point when we need to act on what it is that we know. Now, I know a lot of people have, you know, they come up with things. Well, you know, I'm not, I can't do that. I have this disability or I have that or I can't do that or I've never done it before. I don't have experience or I don't have time or whatever or whatever. Or you don't know my past and so on and so forth. I want to read a little excerpt from you from a, a book called The Purpose Driven Life. This is on page 275. Just listen to this. It's fairly short. Listen, to it. I think this is really good. The great missionary who was named Hudson Taylor said this. He said, all of God's giants were weak people. Moses' weakness was his temper. It caused him to murder an Egyptian and strike the rock that he was supposed to speak to and break the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And yet God transformed Moses into the humblest man on earth, another verse says. Gideon's weakness was low self-esteem and deep insecurities, but God transformed him into a mighty man of valor. Abraham's weakness was fear. Not once, but twice, he claimed that his wife was a sister to protect himself because he was afraid. But God transformed Abraham into the father of those who have faith. Impulsive and weak-willed Peter became a rock. The adulterer David became a man after God's own heart. And John, who was one of the arrogant sons of thunder... He became the apostle of love. And the list could go on and on and on. The point is that God specializes turning weaknesses into strengths. And he'll do that with you too. So what excuses have you been giving for why I'm not serving? I just gave you a whole list as enumerated in that book of people who had weaknesses. But when a person is willing, God will take those weaknesses and he will turn them into strengths. You know what? This past week, 
Uh, Jenna Word was up here. I was having a, a conversation with Jenna Word. My wife and her were in this for you. She had such a good attitude. I really appreciated this. I wish this attitude would be catching in our whole church. Here's, here's what she said. Uh, she works at the school, and they had a day off for Martin Luther King Day. So it was Monday. She was up here on her day off. She comes up here to work, and she said, you know, I've just been thinking for a long time. You know, I, I have some gifts, and I have some skills, and, but I haven't really been putting them to work here like I'm supposed to. And so she had come up with some ideas. In fact, if you're a lady and you go into the ladies' restroom that goes uh, you know, right out the floor, you're the one on the right out there, if you'll go in there, you'll notice something's different in that restroom. Number one, it's cleaner. Jana actually quoted me. She remembered that I had given that statistic that 80% of all first-time guests uh, determine whether they come back based on the cleanliness of the restrooms. Thank you for remembering a sermon and something I said one time. Thank you for that. She remembered that, and she went in there and cleaned it up a little bit, and then she put some, some scripture verses and things in there. And I know what you're probably thinking. How do you know they're in there, Mike? That's in the ladies' restroom. Well, when there was no one here, when everybody was gone, and I was assured that everybody was gone, I went in there and looked, and I thought, this looks pretty nice. It looks pretty good. And I was just thinking, you know what, if I was a guest, if I was a woman, and I would, came in here, I would, I, this would kind of brighten the mood up a little bit. And her whole attitude was, you know what, why don't I take what I'm good at, why don't, why don't I take some things that I know I can do and that I like to do, why don't I do them here? That's a good idea. That's a good question. Uh, let me tell you about something that uh, another church that we were at one time because you might be thinking, well, you know, I can't, I'm not a good teacher, I'm not a public speaker or whatever. There are lots of things that need to be done in the church. Everybody in here needs to know this. Whatever skills you have, whatever they are, whatever gifts God has given you, whatever your passion is, you can use that to bless this body. Let me give you an example. A long time ago, Lauren Tiffany and I lived in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. I was a minister there. And there were some men in this church that liked cars, like we have some guys here that like cars. And they like to work on cars and fix stuff and tinker with things and all that. And they got to thinking, how can we use what we like? What can we do with this skill that we have? You know, they, were, they liked working with gears and, you know, all this other kind of stuff. They liked fixing cars. How can we bless our church with that? So they started at our church a car care ministry. And you might think, what is that? Here's how it worked. One Saturday a month, and we had a, a big barn out behind our church building that had two bays in it. They cleaned it all out. And if you needed a repair done on your car, like you needed a brake job or you needed an oil change or you needed a fuel pump replaced or something like that, especially for people who were like widows and people didn't know how to work on cars or didn't have much money, you just come up there. And they would, uh, all you would have to pay for is for the price of the part, and they would do all the labor for free. And as you know, most of the, the cost of getting your car fixed is for the labor, right? They do all that for free. And if you couldn't even afford that, like if you were an elderly person who was on a fixed income and you couldn't afford to have the brakes done, we had it in our church budget, we'd just pay for it for you. And they used their skills, and one of them was a lady, I remember. She was good at working on cars. And they would do that one Saturday a month. Just what a blessing to the people of the church. I think that's a good example of what you can do. Now, you might not be able to work on cars, but you have some skill. Everybody does. Everybody has something. What you need to think about is, how can I take what I'm good at, and how can I bless people here at this church with that? Uh, we all probably remember this parable. At the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, or close to the end of the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 25, Jesus tells this parable, the parable of the sheep and the goats. And he starts that parable off like this. The parable starts off, he says, you know, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, he's talking about the sec second coming of Christ, and all the nations are gathered before them, it says he's going to separate the people, kind of like a shepherd she separates the sheep from the goats. And the sheep he's going to put on his right hand. And he's going to say, blessed are you. Come and inherit the kingdom which has been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. And to the goats on his left, he's going to say, you guys, you're going to be separated me. You're going to go into a place of punishment. 
But here's what I want you to notice. I want you to notice why. What criteria does Jesus use to determine who is going to ultimately be saved and who is ultimately not going to be? I want you to notice the criteria. The people on the right, or on the right that he said, Blessed are you, come inherit the kingdom that's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. He then goes on to say, he says, Because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a, a guest or a foreigner and you welcomed me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then notice what they say. He says, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Because they asked him, we don't remember doing that to you. And he said, when you did it to other people, when you saw other people who were naked, who needed food, who were sick, who needed caring for, and you did it to them, it was the same as doing it to me. And to the people that he pr pronounced eternal judgment on, they said, we don't remember doing, not doing that to you. And he says, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you were refusing to help me. Now, we're not saved by our works, but we are saved for good works. So I think what we all need to ask ourselves is this, based on this last verse. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what's due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. This is a sobering thought to think of. One day we're all going to die, and when you die, you're going to meet God. Now, I don't know everything about the Bible. I don't know everything that's going to happen in the end times, but I do know that. When you die, what's going to happen? You're going to meet God. That is definitely what's going to happen. And you're going to give an account of yourself to God. How many of you, even though you're not saved by your works, you are saved for works. I do not want to stand before God on the day of judgment and say, you know what, God? I just believed I was saved by your grace, and I proceeded to just live my life for myself and just blow off everything you asked me to do. I didn't serve my church in any kind of way. I didn't use my gifts in any kind of way. I didn't make you a priority. I don't want to do that before God, do you? I want to be able to tell God on the day of judgment, I know I'm saved by the grace of Jesus, but I did work for you, not in order to be saved, but out of thankfulness and gratefulness because I was saved. And brothers and sisters, if that thought, if that reality, if that truth that's going to happen, if that doesn't get us all on board, I don't know what else it's going to take. And I hope and pray that this message of God from his word, I hope the Holy Spirit has activated it in your heart today. Maybe there's something you need to change. Maybe you could say, you know what? I really haven't been all aboard. I've just kind of been sitting instead of serving. And I know God's call is for me to serve. And so I need to change some things this year. And if God has spoken to you in that kind of way, and if we can help you, pray for you, counsel with you, talk to you about things that need to be done here, uh, that's what we're here to do. And that's why we always sing a song of encouragement, because we want to give people an opportunity to act on what they've heard, whether that be publicly or privately. So if we can help you do that in any kind of way today, uh, please allow us to do that as we stand and sing this song of encouragement.